Is it is it uh, working now? Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. I can see the slides. Oh, oh good. Sorry Thanks. for the. Did no problem. <laughs> no problem. Is working. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Hassan, and with me are my two colleagues, uh, Manahil and Rana. And um, we'll be making our presentation on social tipping dynamics. Okay, we'll be making our presentation on social tipping dynamics for stabilizing the climate by 2050. So first, we'll give uh, a general overview of the paper. Then we'll discuss uh, metabolism and economic growth. Then we'll, um, we'll give you the perspective of um, the Global South, which somehow either poorly emphasized in the paper or missing. So then we'll discuss the theories of change, um, pathways for a global transformation, then we'll conclude briefly. So um, for this section, we'll give like a, um, you all know that we are currently in a climate emergency. There's like a scientific consensus on it. Um, some damaging climate uh, tipping points have already been hit and um, others are being approached. Um, as you can see, okay. As you can see on the, uh, on the chart, the green line indicates the current trajectory. So basically, if we keep doing what we are doing, we'll be screwed at the end of the century. But um, to, achieve some, to achieve the climate, uh, the ambitious 1.5 degrees centigrade goal of, of the Paris Agreement or the two degree, we need rapid transformation of, uh, of the society and activity. To put this into perspective, um, we we'll need to like have the global greenhouse gas emission by like every decade, and it will need to steadily decrease to reach net zero emission by 2050. Um, yes, else will cause us like dangerous tipping points. And the only way to achieve this, as I said, is to like um, believe that there exists some um, social dynamics that um, will stimulate the Earth to change. So basically, it's analogous to a butterfly effect. Yeah, a small change can lead to like a rapid change somewhere else. So the question here is how reliable are transformative social drivers in achieving social, economic, and climate goals? So throughout our presentation, we'll be taking a look at this. Okay, so basically, this is what we are trying to avoid. Okay, sorry. So basically, this is what we are trying to avoid. So, um, next. Okay, okay, thank you. So this is like the summary of um, the, um, the goal of the paper, the entire paper. The earth is locked in uh, in a state of some sort of inertia and we need social tipping interventions uh, in order to like lower the curve. And as we explained earlier, this is not like a smooth process, but yeah, social tipping interventions will be responsible because as you all know, current trajectory show that we won't get to the decarbonized state that we hope to achieve. So. The goal is for these social tipping uh, interventions to like lower the curve and to uh, arrive at a decarbonized state um, based on the Paris Agreement. So, next. Okay, so we have the STIs, we have the STE. So the STIs, I won't spend much time here. The STIs are the intervention that is needed. Then the STEs are the subdomains of the earth system that this intervention takes place. Um, and basically the whole of the, uh, the idea of the whole interaction of the ST, um, STIs in the STEs is to achieve the net zero anthropogenic um, greenhouse gas emission. And we have the fossil fuel subsidy STI, which um, operates within the um, energy production and storage um, STEs. And we have the carbon neutral cities, which is in the domain of the human settlement, then we have the divestment movement, and, uh, which operates in the financial market and um, other STEs and their corresponding STIs. Like she said, it's not a linear process that can interact, but this is the ultimate goal. So um, I'll leave. So now we would like to broaden up a bit the scope of the paper by connecting the STE to social metabolism and economic growth. Next slide, please. So to start with uh, the notion of social metabolism, it's a concept in ecological economics and industrial ecology that captures the need of a human society for material and energy consumption. So as a biological 
organism, as a metabolism, a society also has a metabolism that relies on material and energy use. So this concept of social media mo mobilism is like embedded in a um, strong sustainability approach. So we have, uh, it captures basically the biophysical exchange between society and nature in the um, in flows of material and energy. And we have the economy embedded in society, which is embedded in a bigger container of nature. So um, what Kaufman says about so social meta meta metabolism is that the metabolism of the society is the major driver of global environmental change and exerts pressures on the environment, both on the input sides when resources are extracted during the use phase, and finally also on the output sides when waste and emission are discharged. Um, what Kaufman says as well is that in the course of human history, the social metabolism has been very different. So the use of materials and uh, in, uh, energy has been very different compared to, for example, hunter-gatherer society and um, an agrarian regime. We are in a very industrial society that uses a lot, very high um, material and energy use, which obviously now uh, everyone knows. Um, can we go on on the next slide? Thank you. Um, so now if we connect that to the question of economic growth, we can obviously see that economic growth relies on a high material and energy throughput. And as it was pointed out in the presentation of Otto just before, uh, the technological advancement will play a little role, uh, can improve resource use and efficiency, but they're not gonna be the major change, the major uh, driver for the change. And, um, and yeah, in and question of decoupling, we can see that an absolute permanent global and sufficiently rapid decoupling of economic growth from both resource use and environmental impacts, like taking into account all the planetary boundaries is in basically impossible. Like it's has been shown by Parikh and a lot of others, um, great authors, it's, it's basically impossible. Um, so if we, um, if we think now, can we go on the next slide, please? Um, yeah, so if we think about the papers, uh, actually the question on economic growth has been relatively absent, it's not mentioned. So a simple question would be, uh, what is the paper's position on economic growth? And would you consider the downsizing of energy and material throughput in the global north as a possible SCI for decarbonization? Is it better to answer the question now or at the end? At the end, okay. Okay, so. <laughs> okay, um, since Lorraine already talked about the economic growth in Global North, I'm going to be talking about the perspective of Global South because we love inclusion and diversity. So one of the biggest debates uh, at any climate uh, change debates um, or talks, uh, including COP27 this year, has been about the loss and damage funds for the poor countries that have been suffering the brunt of extreme weather uh, due to the climate breakdown, while rich countries continue to uh, fail to live up to the promises of cutting emissions and providing finance to help deal uh, these countries with the losses. The cost of dealing with climate crisis uh, rests on the balance sheets uh, of frontline states that made little, uh, little to no contribution to this problem. Therefore, climate change requires a new financial architect uh, architecture and uh, financing framework, uh, especially for small island states that are going to be um, inundated by the rising sea levels pretty soon. The good news is that um, up, uh, up till now, so far, five European countries have committed to address loss and damage. Uh, these include Austria, Scotland, Belgium, Denmark, and, uh, Belgium, Denmark, and Germany. And although it is a big win, uh, no doubt, there are still many countries in the global north that keep questioning uh, whether um, Global South is ready to make use of climate finance and they justify their inaction in this way. Uh, the crisis is fundamentally uh, an issue of peace and justice and loss and damage funds are not charity, they are climate justice. Next slide, please. Uh, then we move on to the different STIs mentioned in the paper. Most of them include incredible solutions, but this is not the next slide. Um, can you go back? Yes, this is the next slide. Um, however, some of these triggers do not seem viable for uh, some cases, especially countries in the global south. 
for example, if we talk about SDI2, which is carbon neutral cities uh, that is included in human settlements, uh, for a lot of countries in global south, uh, it is not affordable uh, to do this, especially without any sort of external financing. Or if you talk about SDI4, which is revealing the moral implications of fossil fuels, or maybe SDI5, which is strengthening climate education and engagement. All of these sound like uh, great plans, but they are very long-term plans that can take up to decades or even centuries uh, to fully come into effect. And do these countries have this much time? Because climate crisis is an emergency uh, and time is crucial for most of these countries and it does not make sense for them to implement uh, these long-term plans because it might be too late by the time the results come into effect. The map shows the Global Climate uh, Risk Index, which analyzes the extent to which each region and uh, countries in each region have been affected by the impacts of weather-related events. And uh, Puerto Rico, Myanmar, Haiti come in the top three, followed by Philippines, Pakistan, and Vietnam. Uh, next slide, please. When we get into details of these top 10 countries, Puerto Rico is still recovering from Hurricane uh, Maria of 2017, which killed nearly 3,000 people, caused more than $90 billion in damages, including a blackout that lasted for 11 months. In 2022, it was hit again by uh, Hurricane Fiona, which uh, damaged 50% of transmission lines and distribution feeders across the island. In 22, 2022, Pakistan was also hit by a catastrophic series of floods that caused more than $3 billion in losses, affected uh, 35 million people, and caused a health crisis for more than 8 million people that were displaced due to the stagnant waters that caused waterborne diseases and vector-borne diseases. They are particularly impacting the poorest and most vulnerable districts, of course, and the human impact um, uh, assessment highlights that the national poverty rate may increase up to four percentage points, potentially pushing eight to nine million people um, below the poverty line, more people below the poverty line because there are still already a lot of them. Uh, next slide, please. I know these were a lot of numbers thrown at you guys, so I sort of uh, made this infographic to, yeah, um, to give, a give a perspective of the amount of population that has been displaced, which is equal to half of England's population, 3.5 times of UAE's population and combined population of Texas and New York. Overall for developing countries, the cost of countering climate related hazards like droughts, floods, earthquake, et cetera, stand at $70 billion per year and it could rise up to $300 billion by the year 2030. Next slide, please. When we talk about uh, the contributors, there are large differences in the current emitters and the past emitters of each country, emissions of each country. So when looking at carbon emissions, we need to look at the cumulative carbon emissions uh, to see which country has contributed most to the global carbon dioxide. Uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, we start looking from uh, the year 1750, which is when it started, and we calculate each country's annual emissions over time. This is done for each country and region over the period from 1751 to 2017. Uh, and there's significant variability in how much they emitted currently and how much they emitted in the past. The United States has emitted uh, more carbon dioxide than any country up to date, which is around 400 billion tons. And it is responsible for 25% of historical emissions. This is twice more than China, which is the next um, national biggest contributor. Um, the 28 countries of European Union have been um, grouped together um, because they usually um, negotiate and set targets on a collaborative basis. They are also a histo uh, big, big historical contributor at 22%. Um, what we notice here is that many of the large emitters today, such as India and Brazil, are not, uh, were not large contributors in a historical context. Next slide. So when we uh, look at historical uh, emissions, um, it's important to see that over history, like the biggest emitters today are not the same as uh, before, such as UK. Uh, which was responsible, which is responsible, which has been responsible recently for uh, quite few emissions. In 2017, it was just one percent. But at the time, in UK was the biggest emitter from 1750 up to until 1900s, as you can see in the graph. There was not enough climate awareness to tax them for the damage that they were causing to the environment. So one common argument in climate justice conversation is that certain countries have reduced their territorial emissions. However, even though that is true for some instances, they have only reduced these emissions at home, but continue to rely on high carbon goods imported from overseas. And generally, the rich countries, including US, Canada, Japan, much of Western Europe, have drastically decreased their emissions, but a large fraction of CO2 remains in the atmosphere for up to 100 years. And these countries are responsible for 50% of these emissions over the past 170 years. Now, um, Hassan will con conclude this session. Okay. Thank you very much. So, extending the discussion on climate justice and uh, finance, I, I will also talk about the fin uh, climate finance, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, 
and the energy deficit. So in the rich countries, the challenge is um, um, clean energy, uh, but why in global South countries, Sub-Saharan Africa, this challenge is more energy. So there is like a mismatch of needs and interests. So um, average consumption per person in Sub-Saharan Africa, excluding South Africa, is a mere 185 kilowatt hour a year compared with about 6,500 in Europe and um, 2,500 in America. To put this into perspective, um, the American refrigerator uh, fridge um, consumes more electricity than the average sub-Saharan African person. So this is a huge energy inequality that needs to be um, really considered in international climate change and energy discourse. Um, so, Low energy use is a consequence of poverty, but it is also a cause of it. If Africa is, uh, is to grow and to increase um, its um, development index, there's a need for more um, energy consumption. So we have other estimates of uh, International Energy Agency on future energy needs, but the, the point has been made. No, still, I'm still there. Yeah, thank you. So. <laughs> To be, to be sure, um, it is good to develop in a clean and green way um, um, because um, 22 of 54 African countries are already, already rely on renewable energy. But to hope that Africa can completely decarbonize, especially within a short time frame that uh, like Manahi made reference to, it's kind of scientifically naive if I'm to use the words. And um, yeah, more than half of, um, sub-Saharan African population lack access to basic electricity. And um, Nigeria, my country, has one of the highest energy deficits on the planet. And we rely mostly on um, charcoal, burning of wood to meet basic energy needs. And this has uh, attendant health consequences and, and also um, consequences on the environment. Um, OK. Um, so despite this tremendous, this is where the problem comes, despite this tremendous energy gap, global policies are increasingly constraining Africa's energy technological, technological choices. Rich countries, especially Europe, have repeatedly called for African states to use only renewable power sources, uh, with just the belief of leapfrogging, just like you can leapfrog landlines to, to mobile phone, it is believed that Africa can leapfrog the fossil fuel fossil aspect of energy used to renewables, which is unproven by any current climate models uh, or statistical models. Okay. So also the renewable only mantra is driven by the unjustified fears of the continent's future emissions, yet under no plausible scenario is Africa a threat to global climate targets. Such demand, like I uh, highlighted earlier, extends to cooking, where some funders will not support any gas project, although they bring immediate and substantial uh, benefit. So the summary of um, this section is that um, while the earth faces um, some long-term climatic dangers, uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa faces a very short-term, extremely short-term existential threat, uh, threat from the lack of um, energy access. So um, also Europe planned um, to introduce in 2026 um, a carbon tax at the European borders on steel, aluminum, and current import is also considered uh, unfair to those seeking to industrialize. So when you, when you like um, put these taxation measures, then you also constrain the industrialization of other countries. Also, coal investment has been like um, like suppressed for a while. So we have the financial need, which is like clearly depicted here. About 300 billion US dollars is needed annually on, on for sub-Saharan African countries to fully transit. Uh, transition, but you can see the actual investment is more or less 30 billion US dollars. So there is a huge energy, um, there, there is a huge gap. And um, so to some, okay, to, to sum this section, to sum this section, you have um, a deficit in financing, a deficit in energy, but most of the financing come in form of debt financing, which already compounds to the problem of inequality. So there is a need for um, some sort of a climate fund, which is not in form of uh, debt, but in form of compensation for the decades of uh, emission that advanced countries have meted on top Saharan Africa. So since we seem to be running out of time, I'll pass the microphone now. Okay, so, 
uh, can we still finish or do we? Uh, we have like two, just ten minutes. Thank okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> very, <laughs> very short. Next slide. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to try to be very quick. Um, when we talk about global transformation, the question of theories of change, of course, arise. And next slide, please. Um, and just to present briefly, there is like this idea of top down approach in which change is induced by government and, and decision making. And on the other side, the bottom up approach, um, which gives the idea that change is induced within, so within the society, in grassroots movements, niches, and so on. And, um, and when talking about theories of change, uh, it's very important uh, for us and in general to connect it with the question of power and hegemony. And that's why we wanted to also introduce the concept of the imperial mode of living. That is a concept of Ulrich Brandt and Markus Wiesen. And that basically says that people's everyday practices, including individual and societal orientation, as well as identities, rely on the unlimited appropriation of resources a disproportionate claim to global and local ecosystems and sink, and finally, um, cheap labor from everywhere. And what is important is also that um, this, this concept of imperial mode of living, it's, it's rooted in the, um, in the Gramscian theory of hegemony, in the sense also that um, the, this imperial mode of living is safeguarded by the states, which has a role in, in this power relationship in establishing this dominant mode of living. And uh, very quickly again, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna let Hassan talk about a uh, very important. Okay, for this section, I won't like present the, the, the detail, I'll just present the summary. So one of the arguments in the paper on how changing societal norms and values um, um, can tip the, like can lead to big effect, just like the multiply effect, they mentioned the, um, um, the transatlantic slave trade that changing societal norms and value actually led to the abolition of the slave trade. But again, a brief literature review clearly indicated that there are other reasons and in fact, more superior reasons for the abolition of slave trade. And here I, um, I review the economic reason for the abolition of trade trade. We have two uh, areas. We have theory of free labor and wages, and we have the impact of industrialization. So basically what this part is saying is that um, industrial revolution initially stimulated slave trade, right? But again, uh, when, when Britain became, um, uh, became industrialized, they needed markets for their goods and services. They also needed raw, mat uh, raw material inputs in the form of palm oil to light up their industries and to serve as lubricant. So the basic argument here is that the, uh, the abolition of the, the slave trade is based on economic convenience and not uh, humanitarian uh, for humanitarian reasons. This is not to argue that humanitarianism may not have perhaps indirect or to an extent insignificant effect, but clearly the slave trade ended because uh, it's, it's economically convenient for some people because that was the reason why it began in the first place. When slave trade began, there were established social norms and values, but when Britain became highly industrialized and, industrialized and it was convenient for the slave trade to end, then it ended. So this is my argument here. So like, okay. <laughs> and uh, so as Hassan showed with this example is that uh, there is not only one simple contagion model to explain uh, change and that of course social movement play a very important role in like making change but these uh, power structures are very present still and like question we wanted to ask is that given the role of the state in maintaining the status quo current imperial mode of living, how much power do the grassroots movement actually have to affect uh, radical change? And maybe as it's a very, very broad question, uh, you could also use an example of social movement and conflicting interests. Um, also maybe like one in Austria, for example, the Luba Live movement can be. Yes, maybe, so I, I don't know where we can start, but uh, we, <laughs> we had a lot of questions. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. The first one. Great, great presentation. Like really many um, thoughts and many interesting questions. So should I uh, comment or answer the questions, or should we leave it to to the others uh, in the group? Or I think you you can answer, and maybe if other people wants to. 
Uh, okay. So uh, you have five minutes to answer the questions. Lois, it's not so much. <laughs> Very sorry. Uh, yeah. All of them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, where, where to start? I, I think these are great questions. And um, I think there's no uh, simple um, answer to them. Um, but I, I think it's, it's more important to talk about those questions here yeah, and to discuss it uh, than, you know, to, to give like a concrete uh, answer. Um, because I think there is no like a straightforward uh, answer. Yeah, like all the points that you mentioned, they are um, extremely important. Yeah, so like you, you mentioned like changes in, in capitalism and uh, uh, and changing kind of the metabolic um, um, type of, of our societies. I think it's it's uh, uh, extremely important. Uh, yeah, so uh, there's even research showing that uh, uh, like we cannot meet uh, the climate policy goals if we maintain this you know, high um, energy uh, use. So we have to get to like uh, um, an, an energy use that was uh, that we had like in the 1970s. Yeah. So so we have to decrease uh, overall. And like you mentioned, also this this global south perspective. And I fully agree that you have to uh, give people access to uh, to electricity. And of course, you know, no one should be suffering hunger. Yeah, this is like maybe like even the first uh, um, uh, condition. Yeah, that uh, it's it's uh, it's just not acceptable that in the twenty first uh, personal uh, first twenty first uh, century we still have uh, people suffering hunger and especially children. Yeah, so this is uh, just not acceptable. So we uh, have to we need some minimum uh, living standards for for everyone. And, and of course, also um, electricity access. But at the same time, it's also, um, I think, not uh, realistic to assume that we can build anywhere in the world new uh, coal uh, power plants, yeah, or uh, even power plants uh, run, run um, on gas, yeah. Um, and, and I think we, we do have those, those new technologies. So uh, the question is about the technology transfer and like, uh, providing electricity access uh, to the global south, but through renewables, yes, yeah, so that you don't uh, increase uh, the emissions. Uh, I think loss and damage is, uh, again, extremely important, but it's in, uh, but again, the, the problem is now how to allocate this money uh, in a way that it goes you know, to, to projects that to truly improve uh, human well-being and don't uh, increase the, 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 the footprint, the environmental footprint uh, of our societies. Um, yeah, the imperial mode of living, I, I fully agree. Like, can if you think about like a successful lifestyle? It's a lifestyle that uh, has like a very uh, huge uh, energy and resource use. Um, so uh, yeah, we we have to kind of redefine um, those standards. Uh, and maybe like uh, shortly, like uh, this uh, at the end, this comment about slavery um, uh, abolition. Uh, it's true uh, in some way, but there's also some historic research that shows that actually this uh, slavery revolution movement started like in a very kind of small group of intellectuals, and it was like first driven by moral arguments. So uh, I, I don't uh, argue yet yeah, that at that time, no, yes, it was possible to um, to uh, um, to to yeah have like paid labor instead of slave uh, labor. But uh, it wasn't only economic uh, reasons, yes. So I, I think this, uh, um, uh, like, or without those kind of moral arguments, probably the, the movement would not spread so 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 rapidly, or we would still have uh, uh, slave uh, slavery in, in some uh, um, um, like parts um, or big parts of the world. Yeah, of, of course, you now like still we have this this problem of like modern slavery and and and, but 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 I think it's it's rather. Um, um, minor, yeah, um, and again, like you can compare it with with currently of the situation of, of high energy prices, and uh, um, and for instance, the, the fact that we don't want to, like in Europe at least, we don't want to buy uh, oil from Russia. It's not driven by economic arguments; it's driven by by moral arguments. Yeah, and people don't uh, protest. Yeah, they agree to this. Yeah, because like uh, uh, I, I, you know, I prefer to I don't know walk or on bike or use public transportation rather to buy oil from from Russia, uh, even if it's cheap, uh, and kind of contribute to um, 
to the stress of, of people and uh, people losing uh, their lives. Yeah. Um, yeah, but well, at the end, like really great points. So, so thank you for for bringing it all. Uh, um, Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks Ilona. Thanks, Ilona. We, we'll take uh, a few questions, uh, group a few questions, maybe just one round that we will see, depending on. So we have to to close the session in 15 minutes anyway. So. Um, hello, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I want to come back to, I think, your conclusion about who is going to be the actors and to actually like lead to some change with like a small percentage of people and then naming some groups. Um, I would actually like absolutely disagree because you first outlined that it's 1% of the population who causes so much like damage to the environment by emitting CO2. We're not going, they are not going to change with students or young people going out on the streets. We saw that. So I think it's a bit of a, yeah, putting it all on the individual argument to change a system and not to those who are in power. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, my name is Gabriel. I'm from Brazil. Um, I also have a com uh, and also thank you, uh, my colleagues, uh, Lorena, Manahil, and Hassan. Inspired on you, especially on what to, the perspectives you, you brought. I was looking at this at the social tipping element and social tipping tipping points, and uh, I don't know. I feel that they are not enough, given my um, background in Brazil, developing South Country, and uh, um, I'd like to say, I think, for example, that we, when you think about it, yeah, then I went to your article in the appendix to see who was the people that uh, actually defined the social tipping points and 56% were European and 19% were North American. So I'd like to know if you'd like, if you intend to do this social tipping survey again with uh, more people from Global South. And I'd like just to give a, a take on this. Um, I think tipping points on global self must be tied to higher improvement in human well-being always. And because of that, they must always address international inequalities. Yeah, where are these jobs, green jobs? Which one are the unequal ecological exchanges? And we must address the structural changes. We have been trying to, to change our structure of our countries for years. We cannot even industrialize. Uh, how come we we, we uh, help improve human being in ecological sense? Um, and I think the um, I mean this challenge of ecological transition only adds up to many challenges we have been failing constantly. So it's not like subsidy programs that's going to change. Um, I think we must go way beyond this. And I think then the problem is how social sciences work. I think there are people working on this in social science, but they are quite invisible. Ecological economics and development economics, for example, they are not mainstream. Uh, if you take a normal economics book, they don't talk about them. But I think you can find many answers on the literature already. They already exist, I think. They are just not mentioned as they are not here in this table of the social tipping points. So yes, I think it's just a question of how social science at the end is structured and some people are just invisible, some arguments. Um, well, hi, thank you for your presentation. Thank you, guys and girls, uh, for your comments. I'm going to build up on something that actually Hassan brought up, which is the fact that slavery did not end it because of some moral change, but because the economic system was not making it not more profitable. And some comments you did about like slavery being morally um, wrong in this part of the world right now, but actually there is a lot of consumption done that it's like has it was done by slaves even today especially in the fishing industry there is a lot of things going on um the clothing industry the world cup that's going to start on sunday too and people are still going to attend to the matches or go to qatar or stuff so how is it possible if we still have slavery going on today and we still have consumption that is based on slavery uh how can we even think of actually reaching these social tipping points if slavery is still existing. So it may not be as the way it used to be or as explicit that it was, but it still happens. And normal people like us, when we buy tuna, canned tuna, <laughs> there is a big chance that it comes from like uh, some slave ships fishing in the South Atlantic. So how? How can we actually do it if we still allow for it? 
we have more questions. Uh, yes, thank you for your presentation. Um, I think I want to build a little bit on what Gabriel said. I don't want to make it too long. Um, I think there's a few points that I saw in the beginning. I think when we talk about social tipping points, um, to me it was a bit misleading because we're talking about a tipping point towards the good part. You know, we're talking about a tipping part point towards st stability. And also your model that you showed with this, the curve, it seemed like the earth is in an equilibrium right now, which it clearly isn't. So I don't know, maybe you would reconsider this when you present it to people that maybe have not studied, I don't know, economics or these climate science. It's maybe a little bit misleading. Um, and then again, pointing to what Gabriel said, I think the important role of international trade, um, as Gabriel mentioned, ecologically unequal exchange, um, the history of how trade relations are built and how under these relations periphery countries suffer. Um, I think this is a major point that we have to address. And I think these things are not being addressed by, as also uh, Judith said before, small movements um, in, yeah, in the core countries. Um, I think we have to go much broader and consider like the power relations, not also within countries, but also between countries and the systematic uh, impacts that, that yeah, are needed. And for that, I think your graph or like the table that you showed, to me, it seemed like a big focus was on market, a big focus on finance, a big focus on, and then we said about the, the value systems. And I think power is missing a little bit, or at least structural structure change. Yeah. Okay, maybe we can have a, a round of, of answer. And if we have some time, we'll take a few additional questions. Yeah. Ilona. Yeah, thanks a lot for those questions. They're yeah, really, uh, yeah, really great thoughts. And you know, I, I'm completely open up uh, to critique, yeah, because uh, as one of you mentioned, yeah, the experts that we included in the research were mostly from uh, the global north. Uh, we, um, we 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 did approach uh, global south experts, but just not so many responded to to our uh, request, yeah, uh, for various reasons, yeah. Maybe that's you know people don't have. Uh, maybe such good uh, internet access or they don't check uh, the emails regularly uh, and, and things like this, or, or maybe that kind of that time, uh, it wasn't like really uh, in the core interest of uh, uh, of the experts, this type of research was like a few years ago, yeah. Um, but I uh, uh, truly agree that uh, you know, our research was in a way biased because we had uh, mostly experts from the global north, but at the same time, uh, the problem is is uh, is more about you know the, the global north yeah because like this is the the world regions where where you have those extremely high emissions yeah so uh, in a way yes it's it's biased but it's also kind of um, I think that this the stronger focus on the global north is is is, is in some way uh, justified yeah but I I I really like this idea to to repeat the research. Uh, and ask and try to get more to to global south uh, experts yeah. Um, and exactly ask the same question, like what, what could be those uh, interventions that could be, bring rapid change and at the same time uh, improve well-being in the global south. So, so I think this is, this is a great suggestion. Um, maybe we should uh, follow it. Um, I um, also like your comments on, on the leadership and power relationships. I think that it's, it's extremely important. Um, and we see it now that... Uh, in a way, we are in a crisis of global elites because I think global elites, uh, wherever they are, they are kind of trying to um, kind of post or, or prolong the status quo. Yeah, and uh, they are kind of uh, holding their positions uh, and and, um, and and trying not to 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 get uh, um, um, I know today retirement. And and by the way, you know, like most of the the leaders of companies of uh, I know governments that I meet, they are older white uh, male persons yeah so it's actually kind of uh, men uh, mostly white men above uh, 50 60 who are in those leadership uh, uh, propositions mostly yeah and uh, so, so maybe yeah, we, we need a change also in the leadership that you need uh, younger people you need more uh, I mean people with the diverse uh, background you need more women yeah in the in the leadership positions. Uh, to change the system and, and just to give you an example like uh, just this week I, I was doing research in, in Romania on the coal transition in Romania and uh, the leaders there like of the you know energy company of, of the like local government 
they know they are aware of the EU climate goals, but they really said that they hope the goals will be uh, or this whole transition will be postponed by by 30 years. And like you look at them and they are, you know, uh, at the edge of their retirement. So they really hope you know, that they can maintain their positions until they get retired. And then, you know, like other people can worry about it. Yes, I think it's it's um, globally there's this mechanism yeah, that um, those uh, people in the leadership positions, they are um, older and they just want to kind of, you know, keep the status quo um, and, and kind of get, uh, you know, safely to, to, to their retirement. But uh, of course, you know, um, uh, and, and I also heard, you know, that many uh, very uh, wealthy persons, they, they build bunkers, yeah, and, and they kind of prepare for like a, a social collapse uh, scenario. And I think, yeah, uh, um, I, I'm trying to, to, to get, you know, to, to, to this uh, very, very wealthy persons, but it's, it's very difficult because they are very protected, yeah, so it's very difficult to reach them. Um, but I think this is like maybe some some uh, idea for for research to to try to understand like they 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 kind of mental models that you're using and try to find ways uh, to uh, to to reach them. But in a way, I, I think we also need like a global like a new global social pact, yeah, because like uh, uh, the current leaders of national states uh, of of I know companies, uh, they have privileged positions, but they are. Uh, uh, not taking the responsibility yet. So, so then in a way, I think they know what is happening, but they are trying to delay action. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, like you, you're mentioning like social movements, um, but more than this, I think we need uh, like more civil disobedience yeah, and, and, and protests like uh, that are also happening right now. Um, and maybe even kind of tar targeted pro protests, yeah, targeting, um, for instance, oil companies, um, uh, maybe I don't know wealthy neighborhoods and 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 trying you not know, to 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 get to this uh, people and I think there is like quite a lot of in the debate about this kind of um, between country inequality but I think it's also within country inequality so if you look at for instance like in this view that I showed about emissions in the German society the people in the bottom they they have very low emissions yeah it's like really the um, that the top emitters who who know who, who drive those high averages yeah and it's uh, um so, so I, I think you know uh, you have to think about this kind of like a global um um, um elite class that that uh, that you know that needs to be uh, addressed and it's like uh, uh, and it's uh, not the problem of countries you know so, uh, so much as the problem of, of elites with, within countries and, and the top emitters within countries um, yeah, great comments. Um, uh, the slavery abolition, I completely agree. It's, it's still of a, of a problem and uh, uh, it's called like now modern slavery. Um, and, uh, but I think the problem is also like lack, lack of transparency uh, in the global system or also like this kind of alienation that we observe in capitalism that you, you, you don't know where, where the goods uh, come from and uh, it's not transparent, yeah? Like um, how things are, um, um, or, or you, it's very difficult to find information, you know, like where, where, where the goods or, or food that you buy, where, 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 and how it was produced. And I think we need some change. Like we need kind of like more localized systems. So maybe kind of back to more um, local production, of course, like more to circular economy, um, but um, like more transparency. Um, it's it's um, also needed. And 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 of course, and again, like when I when I hear about what is happening now uh, in Qatar, and you know, and uh, all this um, like um, slave or, or kind of slave uh, labor that that was there and was not those really bad bad conditions, I think uh, this should just not be allowed. You know, so and, and again, you no know, no one asked me, but I think there were some uh, elites who were discussing and taking those decisions. And I mean, what we can do, I would say, let's let's you no know, boycott the um, the championship. You know, if you don't turn on your TV, if you don't watch those programs, you no, know, don't um, um, don't you know, don't just you no know, boycott this. Maybe this will be, will have some effect, yeah, because maybe this is what is needed, yeah, to 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 get to um, those people who are responsible uh, for for it. Okay, thanks. Maybe if there's a time, yeah, we can have a few more questions. But really, I, 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 thank I you think for... we, we are running out of time, unfortunately. Okay. But we really want to thank you. I, I want also to apologize for the beginning for the technical problems. So, so I hope next time we will see you in person. 
and that we'll be able to, to have you here. Thank you very much, Ilona. Thanks, and see you next time.